How you going? It's your mate inside the wardrobe again. Let me ask you something. Are you following your dream? Your passion? Where would 12-year-old you like to think you are now? And are you there? I'm asking this because I spoke to a fella today who seems to have followed his dreams and his passions wherever they took him. And they took him to some amazing places. He's a Bruce Springsteen fan. He's a big Chelsea fan. And he's worked for Chelsea Football Club as a football writer. He's making a podcast all about Springsteen. And that's what came across to me when I spoke to him. How things hit him, and then he goes... I want to be part of that. And so one of the things was his love of Chelsea Football Club at the beginning. And then he heard Serial, the podcast, a narrative podcast. And then he decided, I want to be part of that too. I want to get involved in making narrative podcasts, which he is now. And one of the narrative podcasts he's making is about Bruce Springsteen, another one of his passions. He really is living the dream. He's a good guy. I like him. And I think you could be inspired by him, especially if you've found yourself somewhere and it's really not really where you want to be. Maybe you should just go and do it, whatever it is that it is that you have to do. Anyway, see if you feel the same after you've seen my chat with Gary Hayes from Highway 61. Gary Hayes. You're the founder or co-founder and director of podcasts at Highway 61. Tell me about Highway 61 because this is an exciting company, isn't it? Yeah, Highway 61. Um, we are a narrative podcast producer, um, although we don't strictly do just narrative podcasts. So that's a contradiction in itself. Um, so we're just trying to bring about um, that American model of podcasting into the UK. Um, you know, to, we're, For anyone uh, that doesn't understand, just explain the difference between a narrative podcaster and, a, and any other kind, like an interview kind or whatever. Yeah, so you, you, you'll speak to most people and they'll say that, oh, they love Serial and they love This American Life or they're fans of what, you know, the content that Gimlet put out on Wondery and, you know, others like that and Luminary as another. Um, but in the UK, that, that style of telling stories through the podcast hasn't really taken off like it has in the states where they're getting you know for, for instance in the case of serial they're getting this true crime murder thriller and telling it over the course of 15 episodes and just really being forensic on the storytelling in terms of where they're going with it but a lot of it is just using a narrative to push the podcast along whereas a lot of podcasts here in the uk which is fine because we, we do a couple of them ourselves which are just sort of talk shows um so, you know, the biggest one that I can think of is something like um, totally, the Totally Football Show or Football Weekly, where you've got three or four people in a room talking football or talking another sport or talking around another issue. So those round tables work, but we just look at it and think that the market is saturated with that content and what value can we offer to the market and what value can we offer to clients and potential clients to sort of push the podcast conversation along in, in the UK. And we're trying to do what they're doing in america and for well for a global audience but with a uk audience you know at the heart of it really so that that's our reason for being that that's why we created the company and it's just trying to drive what is a passion project into a business really now you mentioned serial is that the one that really turned you on to narrative podcasting yeah it really is it's, i was listening to this american life before then but it was on a holiday in mexico listening to serial where i just couldn't get enough of it and i was just laying and i binged it because i was late to it and i just and I, I knew i was going away and i was like actually this this podcast that everyone's talking about i'm gonna just sort of let it build up and i'll listen to it at once while i'm while i'm on holiday and i just got hooked and from there i was you know i was on and i was making these notes of how i could you know ideas that i had maybe for books or ideas i had for other little projects within my line of work at the time, because I was a football writer, I was just like, but this would work better as a podcast. This would work in the serial way. And now years, five, six years later, it took me to Highway 61. 
So you mentioned you were a football writer. Let's talk about your journey then. Where did you grow up? How did it all start? So um, I'm from a, a small town in the Fens called Peterborough. Uh, the Fens is this uh, unglamorous uh, location that is just flat. It's like the, the British version of uh, the Holland and Belgium. It's just flat land. It's grey. It's misty. It's horrible. Uh, and that, that's that's where I'm from. And um, I just grew up there as a Chelsea fan. My, my family are from, well, my dad's from Campbell. My mum's from Bow. And they moved out of London when they started having kids. And um, we, but because of that London connection, we, we were all Chelsea fans growing up. So I'm from a family of eight. I'm number five. I had four older brothers, uh, two younger brothers and one younger sister. And uh, we, we used to go down to Chelsea a lot. Um, and I remember at the time we could never buy... You know, I was eight years old, my first game, eight years old. And um, I remember going down there and just being completely, you know, you know how people talk like the smell of the grass when you first go into a football stadium. Yeah. And it was that mud and grass that... And it's so got... green under the white lights if you go to, yeah. a, to an evening game as well, yeah. Yeah, and it was just this, it was this weird moment that just sort of got me hooked onto Chelsea. And, and obviously I had four older brothers and um, we used to go down a lot. Uh, you know, to watch and p my friends never realised, you know, they didn't believe I was going because they'd be going to watch Peter Ray United where we're going down to watch Chelsea. And they're like, you're not going there because it was such a big thing to us. It was like, you know, this is like 1991. And to go, you know, obviously way before the internet, way before social media and to go to a team in London, to watch a team in London play was just sort of like, that was the thing you saw on TV. You didn't actually go and do it. Um, so it felt like another world away, even though it's 100 miles. Um, so I just got into that. And then I just grew up as a mad Chelsea fan, pitting myself against my four older brothers, that you know sibling rivalry. And my biggest brother, Seb, was the, the beefcake of the family. He's the eldest. And no one can mess with him physically, even now. So it was sort of like, well, how can I get one over him? Well, I'm going to make sure that I not only know more about Chelsea than him, but I can apply that knowledge in a way that he can't. And that was my weird way of wanting to be a football writer because I just wanted to work about, uh, sorry, write about Chelsea and work within and around Chelsea. And that's what I did. So how do you go from that? How do you go from being a kid in Peterborough, not even in London, to being a football writer? Well, I went to university and um, I did a degree in literature, which I, I was going to do a degree in journalism, but I was mad on, well, I still am mad on literature and just love reading and, yeah, and I loved the whole idea of, you know, forming debate through, you know, essays and whatnot. And I, I was a bit of a, um, I wouldn't say a problem child for kids at school. But the thing is, the, the education system we come from was very um, vocationally driven, where they would be like, stop dreaming, just go and be a builder like your dad, you know. And it was very much... And was I'm your dad being, a builder, yeah? Yeah, my dad was a carpenter, yeah. Right. My dad was a carpenter. My mum was just a cleaner. Right. My dad would work all day and um, he would come home. My mum would have done dinner for everyone and then he'd have, we'd all have dinner together and then my mum would go out and clean offices for four hours and we should take me and my brothers with her to help her do it. She could do more jobs just to make ends meet. Yeah. And I remember, um, I was going to say, your, your cat there, just... I was going to apologise <laughs> if a dog walks in shot as well. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 I've got two dogs and they like to wander around and bark. Any, any minute now, you'll get. I've had the cat. You'll get the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about your dad was a was a, a carpenter and your, your mum was a cleaner, and yeah. you you, were, you wanted to be a football writer. Yeah. And and what happened is at school, you know, coming from a state education, I'm sure this is a, it's an experience that a lot of people can relate to. Um, but then a lot of people might say, well, my state school is better than that, and. Well, good. I'm, mine I'm was because... terrible. I went to a, a comprehensive school. It was an awful yeah. school. Yeah. My, mine was horrendous where we were taught to know our place as working yeah. class kids. And yeah. I'm no, by any stretch, am I any, you know, I'm not a rebel or someone who's there trying to preach the gospel of working class pride and power or anything like that. But I was always confused by that because I was like, well, you're getting us to read these books, but you're telling me to pick up a hammer. I was like, I don't get this. So I, <laughs> I, I would be in English lessons and I would want to debate every issue within a Shakespeare play or you know um, or within a text that we were studying you know like if we were reading you know we did very um, you know classic text you know like 
Great Expectations and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and something that I guess a lot of people might get shivers going back to their school memories thinking about it. But I really enjoyed it. But I'd really want to debate those issues with teachers. And um, they would just be like, look, that's not in the grade scheme. That's not in the marking scheme. You, you can't talk about that. This I'm paid to basically tell you to go from A to B to C. And that's what you need to do. Otherwise, you'll be downgraded on your papers. So that, and I think I just annoyed them where they were just like, why, you know, you're just this smart ass who wants to debate it for the sake of de- debating it. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I did do that a lot of the time. I'd be like, oh, no, I'm pushing buttons here. So I'll do it. You know, to, <laughs> yeah. And some, some of the times my mates would give me a jibe, like, go on, do it, do it. But, um, yeah, it was just, I don't know. I just, I just didn't see it in that way where I just wanted to be, I, I, I just, I don't know. I just, you, you get into books and, you know, the, the cliche of books being this fountain of knowledge and everything. And, and that's what was, that was, that was my escapism to me. And, you know, um, my girlfriend is from, um, from New Jersey in America. And, and just the other day we were talking about this, this high school spirit that they have in and pride in the school and pride in the town. And, and I know obviously that's very Hollywood and it's driven by that sense, but that's what I really bought into this. So I really, you know, these books are my escapism. And then that led to my other passion being, Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan, which sort of then helped me fuel this passion for Chelsea, where I could sort of build up this this knowledge or you know this ability to write, I guess. And I'm not trying to say that I'm. How, uh, how, so how? Just explain to me. Was it was it Dylan's writing and Springsteen's writing? I mean, I mean Springsteen, I get it because it's very working class because it's, it's yeah. New Jersey. W- was that you were taking that as a what was it? Was was he showing you that it that people can come from suburbs and and make something of themselves. Was that it, or was it was it deeper I, I think than that? at the time, I got on Springsteen when I was 12, and that comes from um, my dad. Uh, big because we, they would go up to they'd go up to parents' evening. And they'd be like, you know, um, the teacher. Look, he's, he's intelligent, but he's sort of wasting it, you know, because he sort of he's disruptive, or and it weren't disruptive in the way of just wanting to burn the school down or something but it was disruptive in the case of they're like i've got my lesson plan and you're not helping me finish my lesson plan which i can understand when you've got a gobby little 12 year old who is gobby at home because he's got a fight for his place and he comes into school and he's sort of got the same attitude um that you're sort of like there's always one and it's you right so as you get older you understand it but at the same time i was trying to like you know learn more and i was trying to without really knowing it trying to challenge the teachers to give us more you know because when I got to university, I found that I was behind students because they'd had a better education than me. It might have been as well that they applied themselves better than me as well. You know, not not trying to play the victim here, but um, but yeah, I just found that we were just given the bog standard. And um, and what happened is, my dad just you know, it, my dad was like, look, I like him challenging the fort, and you know, he's he's trying to be different, and I'm like, yeah, but that's not going to help him, you know. Um, so I remember you said, look, you talk a bit different to your brothers and you think a bit different. Um, he's like, you want to listen to this? And he gave me an album, which was Born to Run. Right. And, and the, the first the first song on that is Thunder Road. Yeah. And I remember listening to it on vinyl and not quite understanding it fully. You know, you don't understand the sentiment of Roy Orbison singing, you know, for the lonely and everything. You don't understand what it's about. And as you get older, you suddenly get the life experience and the knowledge to apply those lyrics, you know. But then it was just the last line that really struck me where it said, um, it's a town full of losers and I'm pulling out of here to win. And I was just, it was so powerful to me where I was like, wow, I didn't, I, I didn't know he was from New Jersey. I didn't even know what New Jersey was. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and obviously as I started learning more about him, um, you know, from reading books and, you know, going to the local library where, you know, because we didn't have the internet to suddenly start finding out who Bruce Springsteen was and asking my dad and he was telling me and, and just sort of get into grips with this music and what it meant lyrically. And then that lent into Bob Dylan. And I remember, you know, Bob Dylan lyrically was just, I, you know, some of his songs now I don't even understand, you know, and I, I'm sure that a lot of people say they understand them and they don't. Right. Um, but I just, the, the, the early Dylan stuff from, you know, 62 to 67, when I was just listening to that over and over and I heard Mr. Tambourine Man, it just blew my mind. And I remember sitting up, with the CD playing, pausing it, writing down the lyric, play, pause, play, just writing it because I wanted to write out the lyrics to that song. And I took him to school the next day. I was like, oh, guys, I wrote a song. You know, I was like, right. <laughs> and I gave it to my friends and they were like, what is this? The Jingle Jangle Morning, what are you talking about? This is rubbish. And it was only years later that one of my friends 
because I don't I don't really speak to a lot of my friends from school back then. But one of them watched Dangerous Minds and was like, "Hey, that song, you didn't write that song." You know, that was in, I was like, "Yeah, it took, took you that long to work it out." But um, so I was just fascinated with this world that they created, and and I was just fascinated with American culture because it was this world away again. You know, that idea of going to Stamford Bridge as a kid and then suddenly you start absorbing you know and i know it's teen tv but when you're a teenager it means so much and it's it's sort of like your gateway culture into something bigger and better and more informed and more wise i guess and you know so watching shows like dawson's creek just blew my mind because i was just like wow you know these letterman jackets this pride in the school and you know, we don't have that here. You know, we, we sometimes would have a football team if the teachers could be bothered to put the football team together. Yeah. You know, we, we weren't brought up to have pride in where we we're from. It's like we're a machine that's here to take you in and spit you out and just make sure that we tick some boxes along the way. Yeah. And to see in them, and I know, look, America's got its issues. America's got massive, massive issues. But when you're young and you see it and you get that idealism, and yeah, it is an ideal, you know, it's a idyllic image you're getting given by people that have, you know, it's very manufactured, but when you apply <laughs> these teen shows and teen movies to Springsteen and Dylan lyrics, they sort of come together in this perfect storm and it sort of just inspires you in a way that then obviously led to me to go to university and and I know you, you're connecting football with, um, you know, this passion for, for music and it doesn't quite necessarily knit together in the way you might think, but it's very unconventional, but... But if That's you're going to write think. about it, writing is writing, and yeah, yeah, you know sure. if you just got if you were only influenced by football writers, your writing would look like theirs. But if you're taking, you know, things that you're finding from all different varied sources, what's going to come out is going to be so much more original. It's going to be you because it is part of you that's yeah. coming out. So I think you know whatever field you creative field you're in, you've got. It's like, you know, I for years and years worked in radio and it used to annoy me that that radio presenters had only ever heard of like British DJs and I used to listen to well I started on in the, on the radio in Australia and I listened to a guy called Doug Mulray but I'd listen to other people like John Laws and then I'd get tapes of the Grease Man and Howard Stern and the real Don Steele and the, and I'd be and I'd be taking influences from everywhere and it used to annoy me that all the British DJs they'd only listen to like you know um, Simon Mayo or something. Well, nothing wrong with Simon Mayo, but you've oh, got to ha you've, but you've got to have lots of different influences so that the original yeah. you comes out. And it doesn't matter if they're even, you know, in radio you might be on a top forty station, but you can be influenced by classical station presentation if somebody does something really good. And Radio Four and Five Live and everything. So I get I get the connection. Although it doesn't sound like one, it's all about influence and and what yeah, then exactly. when you create, it's got a every it's got a piece of you in it. it it's sort of why um, it's why I was never a good journalist, really. Which is which is. But the... you were curious and inquisitive, which you proved in school by asking more questions about Charles Dickens' work and that, which yeah, is a, yeah. a basic of journalism is to ask questions and to want to get get to a bit further than just the uh, the story you're being told. See what what I, what I found with working in. See, this is what I needed to distinguish, which I, again, it was just being naive and, and I guess maybe being a little bit behind because you don't have that knowledge which you have to pick up. But I, I was like, yeah, I'm a football journalist, I'm a football journalist. And it took me a while to realise, I was like, I'm not a football journalist, I'm a football writer. And and to some someone, that might sound a bit pretentious. And it's like, no, What's it's the not difference good. then for you? So, well, a, fo a football journalist is someone who is, who's got the, you know, they've got their pulse on the news and they're the people that are breaking important stories. I've never written a line of news in my life. You know, right. I've, I've, I, I write features yeah. and, and that, to me, that's a football writer where, or just, just a writer. Right. And, and what I did is I, I went and worked for, you know, I did like shifts at the Sunday times and the Sunday people and, you know, the sun and, you know, anywhere that would have me. I worked for um, an agency called haters. It's a really well-respected um, sports agency and I did that for about six months to a year after I graduated and then it it just sort of it dawned on me I was like look I don't like this I don't like what I have to do to do this because I didn't find it again it sounds really potential but I didn't sign I, it didn't really oil the creative cogs you know and um, it was only when I started writing for Chelsea magazine that I was able to write features 
Now, how did you get that gig then? So you've come out of university, you've done bits and pieces here, there and everywhere, but with some big titles that, you know, the titles you mentioned. I was basically going in just doing the, when I was doing those, you know, those shifts, I was just the the tea and coffee boy who'd get the opportunity to to see the process and do a little bit of research when someone didn't have time to do it. You're in the environment, which is also important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, You sort of absorb and it's sort of what you make of it. It's like, do you sit there and moan that you are just doing these errands? Or do you sort of absorb everything? And I remember I was working on, um, the, it, her name was Julia Margo. I don't know if she still works there, but her name was Julia Margo. I'd, I'd never met her before. I'd never met her since on the uh, news review section of the Sunday Times. And I remember just being there and I was always just, look, I didn't realise I was looking over and she was just like, you're just dying to get on that sports desk, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, how do you know? She goes, I just see you. So she took me over there and really helped me out and got me a couple of shifts on it. Um, but then it sort of, you know, you look behind the curtain, you're like, oh, that's the Wizard of Oz. And I sort of got behind it. And I was like, oh, right, naive me. That's what journalism is. So I understood what it was, but I didn't realize what it was, you know. And I'd start, look, I want to be doing this. I, I, I don't know how, I don't know what I wanted to do. I was just a young, idealistic kid. And I was like, I want to merge all my ideas of, you know, trying to be. Uh, you know, a bit in depth and poetic with what you're trying to do. Again, like I'm saying, I'm not trying to make out I'm Steinbeck here, but, um, you know, but then sort of molding that with this passion for Chelsea. Um, so in the end, what, what happened is as I graduated, Chelsea had just uh, relaunched their magazine and I just hounded the editor there for, I don't know, six months. So in the end, I just called him one day and he goes, because he kept putting off my calls. He goes, what? And I was like, oh, look, I want to do this. He goes, yeah, I've got a stack of, because I was writing him emails and writing him letters and posting them. You know, that's how, you know, 2004 was working then, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, so I've got this idea, uh, you should do some stuff. And, you know, and he was like, okay, look, just give me some ideas. And I think he just wanted to get rid of me. And then I, I'd said this idea about supporters clubs around the world and, you know, trying to bring in that international fan base into the magazine and giving that representation. And he said, yeah, go with it. And I look back at it now and it's horrendous. And <clears throat> I've still got the magazines, but I've got them more for, you know, um, nostalgic you know, reasons than, you know, looking and thinking, wow, I'm re- real proud of this. Cause it was, I look at it now and it was just, you can read, you read it. It's like, okay, here's someone who was learning their craft. You know, it, so, some of them hit the, you know, work, some of them didn't. Um, but then as I developed, um, I ended up working at Chelsea properly. And um, just so before... how, how did that happen? So you, you're writing in the magazine and the magazine's been put out. It's the official magazine for the yeah, club. Yeah, it's yeah. Put, yeah. So it's put out um, cause it was done for a publisher, but they were based at Sanford bridge. And then that, in the end, they just had a job come up, and I think the guy was just like this. Well, I won't rent necessarily a kid, but this kid is just on at me all the time, and um, I might as well, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what he's thinking, because um, uh, yeah, I, I was just, I was just unrelenting. I was like, this is what I want, this is what I want, and nothing in the world at that moment was more important to me than going to work for my boyhood club, and you know, write these features that were completely non-partisan, but just sort of me delving into that passion for, you know, for Chelsea, which I was able to get. And I remember uh, the first piece that I wrote in it, uh, you know, properly in the magazine when I went to work was, um, it was an interview with Dave Sexton. Yeah. uh, Who was a Chelsea manager um, in the late sixties and early seventies. And he had inherited this amazing team from Tommy Doherty. um, And he won the FA cup with Chelsea. He won the cup winners cup with Chelsea. Um, And so that was in 71. And, I did this interview with him and I'd phoned him a couple of weeks before to do the interview. And um, he was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then he had arranged, I was going to go, I wanted to go and do the interview in person. So then he just, it was a bit strange on the phone at the time. And I thought I better just call the day before just to make sure. And I wasn't working at Chelsea at the time. So I wasn't aware of some of the stuff that was going on. And so I was doing this as a freelancer initially. I thought I better just phone to make sure that, you know, he's happy to do the interview still. And I phoned and phoned. No one picked up. And I just left a message like, hi, Dave, it's Gary, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then two weeks later, you know, and I forgot about it because I thought, I'm not going to hound him. If he's not going to call me back, he doesn't want to do it. And then two weeks later, I got this call. And um, it's from a woman called Lara, who was his wife. And she was like, you've left messages about this interview. What interview? I said, oh, I spoke to Dave. And she was like, you, do you do realize Dave's you know, really sick? He's got Alzheimer's. And I was oh, like, oh, I, yeah, I was just like, my expression now is how I was. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I, d- I didn't know. 
And she goes, no, look, it's fine. But what, what did you talk about? And I told her, told her, and she goes, okay, if you don't mind me listening in on the call, then you can do it. But if he's struggling, I'm going to end the call and I'll tell you to stop. And I was like, fine. Yeah. So we just the, the whole idea is I, I propose this idea of like when flower power met player power, you know, and about how Sexton had this, he had to go head to head with like Alan Hudson and Peter Osgood and in the end had to dismantle that team that had won so much for Chelsea. Um, and I did this interview with him and at the end of it, after about 20 minutes, he got off the phone and she was like in tears on the phone. Because she was like, I haven't heard him talk like this for years. Ah, oh, so it was yeah. great for both of them. Yeah, yeah. And because she, she said he doesn't even realise that he's just been visiting his kids in America. Because that's where they'd been. Right. And it was just so sad. And, you know, again, you know, there's no, I, it's not an excuse, but I felt really, you know, insensitive to it. And I just, and I was young where I was like, I just didn't realise talking to someone about Alzheimer's and what it does to the family and that. And I just felt really. And that was another thing that made me, you know, there's people that do important stories, but that was another thing that just sort of turned me off against journalism because I was like, I'm not in it for that. Yeah. I'm not in it to sort of do, tell people. So stories did you did you, did you okay. mention did you mention that in the article or did you keep it out? No, no, no. I kept it out. Yeah, kept right. it out because um, they, they were a very private family. You yeah. Know, and they they wanted to keep it private and yeah. So like, I, it was just doing that. that I felt like I was stepping into a private situation a bit too much yeah and that just made me realize that like you know th there's times you've got to do that but for what i wanted to do i was like that's that wasn't what i felt comfortable doing now some people might say yeah but that is journalism that's what you do but for me i just felt like it no, was i know exactly what you mean too much for a couple of years i presented the breakfast show at bbc wiltshire and it was an all speech show, so it was a news show and i'd only ever been like a music breakfast d jockey disc jockey you know he tell a fart joke and then play Nickelback, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you were getting like really serious stories across. And some of them were really interesting, you know, getting to find out, you know, who's on the council and all the politics and who hates each other and all that. That was good fun. In fact, there was one time I had I had a Labour guy and a, and a Conservative guy and I knew they hated each other. And I just kept getting the Labour guy, guy to talk because I knew it would wind up the Conservative. And uh, he started heavy breathing when he when he got really upset. So I was turned his mic up all the way, so it <laughs> sounded like he was getting even more. But the thing that and I didn't mind all that. That was that was really interesting. But the one I couldn't stand, and in the end, I told him I'm not doing it anymore. Is when they bring people into the studio where something tragic has happened to them, yeah. and you have to talk to them and and say, you know, well, how did you feel and all that. And it's just, yeah. I used to call it tragedy porn. And I would say, yeah. I'm not doing any more tragedy porn. There's, no, there's nothing in it for the listener. There's absolutely nothing in it because, you know, yeah, they can feel sorry for this lady, but they can't help her just by yeah. listening, you know, yeah. unless it's unless it leads to... And it was just... And they did it so much. And in the end, I, so I get exactly what you mean. Journalism, <laughs> actually, over recent years, I'd say over about the, the last five years, there has been less of it, particularly on television. But I think it still goes on. But I know what you mean about and yeah. it, and I just felt so dirty doing that. And I just and that's what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that all journalism is that, but it was sort of like this reality check for me of like, do you want to do that? And I'm not saying that you oh, it's not an important story or you only have to write light, fluffy stuff. You know, I'm not. No, I want to get to the heart of something. But Dave Sexton's Alzheimer's wasn't the story. Mm. You know. Hmm. So that's why I wasn't mentioned there. But then yeah, I remember... the story is about the Chelsea of that day and the yeah, blue exactly. is the colour song yeah. and all that going on. Yeah. 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 Getting him to talk about that was great. And obviously for someone who had been brought up on that era of Chelsea, it was just amazing. I remember it was about a year later um, that I met his grandson and his son-in-law. Um, and because they came to, they were, they were coming to a game and um, they had arranged tickets. I think, I think the editor of the magazine had arranged tickets for him. Um, but the, the deal was that we could take pictures of him. Just the you know, Dave Sexton wasn't there, obviously. It was just the, the grandson and his dad. Um, and we were like, oh, we'll just take some pictures of you in the stadium so we can put it in there to say that you'd come along. And I remember when that happened, I was like, no, no, I want to do it. I was like, I want to do it. I was like, because I want to tell that kid, that grandkid, like who his granddad was. I know, obviously, the parents will tell him. But when I met him, he was like 10 years old. And I went, do you realise who your granddad is? I was like, that guy for me? You know, it was like, it was amazing. As, as a Chelsea fan, I was like, I was brought up on your granddad's team. You know, that team 
because at the time Chelsea weren't you know when I was we had Kerry Dixon and we had our heroes and it was a team that we look back on with fondness but for me growing up it was like obviously you know we, we talk about the 80s as well and it, there was some spurts of brilliance at times but what defined Chelsea up until the current era was Doherty's diamonds that led into Dave Sexton's team you know Ron Harris and Dave Webb and Osgood and Alan Hudson and Peter Benetti and you know all, all these players that sort of were the golden age of Chelsea that's what we were all brought up on like, I remember you know the, the best memories of my childhood of watching this video um six memorable matches uh it's a BBC video on you know constant repeat of my brother's it was just like a game against Man United from like 1967 and a game against, you know, um, Newcastle when Chris Waddle was making his, his debut. I know that goes beyond um, Osgood and whatnot, but just like this era of Chelsea, we were just brought up on it. And it was like that was really bonded us as brothers and it really gave us our relationship with our dad, you know. And, um, and so that team was sort of like the embodiment of what everything Chelsea was and has led into what it is now, you know. So I was just like, I really want to... Yeah, I know it sounds a bit over the top of like wanting to tell a ten-year-old who his granddad was, and like you will understand who he is, you know. But <laughs> but it just sort of just I just felt like a respectful thing to do to respect that family for who Dave Sexton was as well, you know. I just felt yeah, I was like I really want. So I went and met. I gave him the tickets, and I was just like you know to the father, you know to the the son-in-law. I was like, oh look, I, I interviewed Dave, and it was like a massive honour. And still now, like you know 15 16 years after doing it it just feels like a high point in your in your career you know just like being able to do it and i know i, I don't know I, I just get i romanticize about it a lot but just doing stuff like that just means like to me it just means that so much you know i just like i just loved chelsea that much that i was like doing that and talking to dave sexton and being on a level with him you know and then i remember like i went and um when I interviewed uh, Richard Attenborough when he became um, the honorary life president of Chelsea and he, he took me over to his house in Richmond and I was only meant to be there for half an hour and I was in, I was there for like three and a half, four hours because he was like the night, the nicest guy I've ever met. He was just absolutely just like this amazing person and we were just, and I had um, read his book because we, we went there to promote his book but also promote the fact that he had become um, the honorary life president of Chelsea and um, the head of communications at Chelsea at the time just said, oh, look, we've done all the stuff about him being, you know, a Chelsea fan and bringing Raquel Welch to games and stuff and Steve McQueen. What other angles are there? And I was like, well, let's, because I'm a massive film fan. I goes, let's talk about him as a film director and stuff, you know. I was like, let's do that. And we'll say, you know, this is the other side of Richard Attenborough. He's this Chelsea hero to fans, you know, in terms of like he's seen as this, fan that helped bring this glamour of you know where he helped ignite the glamour of the king's road in chelsea um i said so let's do that and i interviewed him about his book and then um he uh he was just this ultimate gent and you know what this wasn't pre-planned but where i'm sat i've got his book right in front of me yeah uh here look so this is the book i was interviewing <laughs> about and then um he signed i got him to i said oh can you sign it for me so look this was the 21st of november 2008 Look at and that. He says, um, uh, all best wishes, Gary. Um, many thanks for your kindness. And when he signed it, I was like, what do you mean? I read it. I was like, what do you mean my kindness? I was like, you're Richard Attenborough. You've kept me <laughs> in your house for three and a half hours. That's the kind, you know, I was like, I can't believe you've given me this time. And he was just, oh, and he was like, oh, darling. And the way he was talking. <laughs> and, and David didn't live far from him. And I said to him, I goes, oh, when I was young, you know, um, I love Jurassic Park, you know, as all kids did of my age. And uh, it was only when my dad said, oh, he's a Chelsea fan. I was like, oh, who is this guy? And he said, oh, you know David Attenborough? Because, uh, you know, again, all kids, even kids now, you know, it's like he transcends generations, doesn't he? He's like, yeah, yeah. David Attenborough, that guy you like, you know, that's his brother. And I couldn't believe it. And I said to him, I said, so, you know, I didn't really know you were. And I didn't, David was the hero until I found out you were a Chelsea fan. And it sort of flipped. <laughs> So he phoned David and went, darling, I've got one of your fans here. Come over. And he was having dinner, with, I think it was with his daughter or someone anyway. He was like, oh, I can't, you know, et cetera. But he was so, like, affable and friendly that I was just pinching myself. I was like, God, here I am. You know, how old was I then? I was like, yeah, I don't know, 25, 24, 25, where you still you feel like you're a man, but then you meet these other people and you realize you're just a kid. 
Yeah. You know, and I was just like, it was an incredible experience. Yeah. So that was working at Chelsea. I just went there and I just started. And that's what I mean about being a football writer where I know I wasn't reporting. I wasn't a journalist. I wasn't recording, uh, reporting hard news. I just wanted to sort of fuel this. Um, yeah. Just fuel this idea of trying to do things in a little bit of a different way. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But that so, was that. so you were you say you were writing for the the magazine and then you got hired by Chelsea. What were you doing when you got hired by them? Oh so, yeah, so I was writing as a freelancer and then I came in and worked full time in the magazine, the program. Right, so, I see. Right, yeah, so, so you write the, program the, notes and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, uh, I wasn't doing the program notes. That was someone else based down at the training ground. But I was um, I was doing you know, every now and then you're doing for Peter Kenyon or someone. You'd go up because there was an announcement and you'd go up and you'd get his notes and you'd write them up for him and get him to sign them off or you'd do it every now and then for the, um, you know, for the chairman or so there, there was a guy at the training ground who would do the manager and the captain, um, who I'm still really good friends with now. Um, and yeah, so I, I was just doing interviews with, you know, players, past players and just, yeah, just doing the magazine program really. And then doing at a time we did match reports, which obviously are dead now in programs because I don't need them. But, um, so yeah, we're just doing the program and the magazine and just, but it was really good because it was a really good team of people where um, you, know, you don't have to be a fan to write about a team. Of course you don't. But having it as all Chelsea fans in that office as well, um, it, you just come with this weird innate knowledge of the club where yeah. you talk about the most obscure stuff. And now I've started <laughs> yeah, I've started writing for the, the program again this year because the guys I worked with back then are still working there. So they were like, oh, look, we've got an idea for a feature. Would you just want to write about it? Because I haven't written about Chelsea for a while. And I said, actually, you know what? I'll do this. Just not that I don't want to go back to doing this, but I'll do it as a one little thing in the programme, you know, every every match. And it's just sort of fun to do. So sort of rekindled the, the joy in doing it again. Um, and must have been, Chelsea... must, sorry, must have been mind-blowing, though, as as a guy in his, in his mid-20s who grew up where Chelsea was almost everything to you to actually go to work at Stamford Bridge. Yeah, oh, it was amazing. And then I, I used to go and have my lunch in the dugout. <laughs> I used to, because we had these AAA passes um, <laughs> so you could get anywhere. So I would just, yeah, I'd go and have my lunch. And you know, I was I was paying off student debt and I was earning a pittance. So I'd have to bring my pat lunch in every day. And I would just, the, the payoff was, well, rather than going down to buy my lunch or whatever, I would... Um, you know, bring my pat lunchbox and sit in the manager's in the manager's seat, and uh, you know, I don't, maybe they might they might find this out and ban me forever now. But <laughs> I used to just sit there and just pinch myself. And I know it's really unprofessional to talk like that, but it was something that I did just for me. And then I'd come home, and my mum and dad had moved to New Zealand by this point, and I'd be like, I'd phone my dad, and I was like, Dad, I was sat in the manager's chair, and he would just laugh. But they knew what it meant to me. You know, yeah. it was just like it just. And I know it sounds it just to say it out loud, it, it sounds really immature, but it's something that's so personal to me. And it was just something that, you know, I was, I was always professional and I was never there like meeting players and going, oh, can I get a selfie or can I get your autograph and that? But it just meant so much to us, you know, just like as, and, you know, being able to talk to my dad about it. And, you know, it was just, yeah, it was an amazing experience. It was just like, you know, and I met so many good people there and it never changed. But, you know, some people thought, oh, you might go there and see the inside of the club and it might change your opinion of it. Yeah. It didn't at all. It's sort of because the people that work there are such a credit to Chelsea that it sort of just reinforced it in a way. And um, obviously you see the inner workings of football and it sort of ties you out a bit, but it doesn't, you know, numb your your love of a football club. So how did you get from, from doing that, from being a football writer, to running a successful podcast company what's the connecting tissue there yeah i, I got bored i think <laughs> <laughs> um the, in, in all seriousness what i did is um I, I i went so far as i could at chelsea and um that's when i realized i was like look i can't just i can't just like live this dream forever and i and i i realized as well that you know bruce springsteen aims to sell out giant stadium in rutherford and he's playing to hundred thousand people and <laughs> And I had targeted just getting to Chelsea and I was like, I need to reassess, you know, what, what I'm doing. And a lot of it as well was just being stubborn. And, you know, I remember teachers telling me, you'll never do that. You're, you're never going to do that. You know, so it was just, um, I want to give you some editing to do it. It was just me going, fuck you, basically. <laughs> um, and I know that sounds really bad, but I was just like, 
that was my that was my uh, my motivation was just like that's what you told me I couldn't do it, I'm gonna do it. And then I would say in the end I realised that if I wanted to do more, I needed to sort of leave, uh, which I did, um, which I didn't want to do, but I knew I had to do it. Um, and then I just started, you know, doing a lot of other stuff. Um, and I've worked for Bleacher Report and um, and from there CNN. And then I just where journalism's gone, that I just realised I was like, you know, in the media, I realised that the stories that I'm trying to tell, I just couldn't tell them in these traditional ways anymore. You know, I wrote I wrote a book about John Terry, and um, again, just getting getting a book published was like this amazing moment for me what well, it should have been and it was just sort of that just really um yeah that was i just didn't like the process of it and it just really uh, it really felt um like it was an ugly process and what what, what, write, like... what the writing process or the getting the no book no out? it was, it was the, the, the publication process you know just like something that you're doing that you're working so hard on then you realize that it's just actually this the fate of this is in the hands of other people and um and then also having it that where you're writing, where it's getting changed so much, where you're like, that's not the story here, though. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, it, it was just called, like, John Terry, 50 defining matches. And they wanted to tell his story through 50 games, you know. And so when I wrote it, I wanted to tell the story of where he was and have this narrative flowing throughout of, like, you know, trying to put him in context of what's going on elsewhere but they wanted just 50 match reports i was like i'm not doing that <laughs> right yeah so yeah I, I didn't do 50 match reports but then i was like constantly having it out with the uh so i just realized my posture was really bad there um <laughs> I, I kept constantly kept having it out with the the publishers and it was just a negative experience for me really it might be that it's just me being too idealistic again and i wasn't being realistic but so i, I did that and i I just got to this point where, you know, I'd heard Serial and I was just it's like, there's a better way of doing this. There's, there's a better way to do this. But then in the UK, it's, I, I think that the UK will get there. And that's why I'm sort of chomping at the bit, like quick, quick, we got to catch up. You know, as Highway 61, we've really got to be pushing, pushing, pushing. You know, there can't be 24 hours in a day. It needs to be 26, you know, yeah. just like, because I feel like everyone's going to catch on at some point. And we need to sort of be the first independent that's doing it. Not, you know, I know the BBC do some great things, but obviously that's the BBC. And I'm like, no, we need, we really need to try getting ahead. And, um, and yeah, just do it, doing the books and, you know, trying to do other stuff that I just realized that if I wanted to do it and do it my way, I needed to show a bit more courage and a bit more, um, I don't know, a bit entrepreneurial, bit more of an entrepreneurial attitude i guess just do um, it yeah 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 just do it exactly yeah to, <laughs> to to steal nike's slogan right yeah just just do it and it took a lot it took a while for me to get there but then i say now to people like i wish i did this five years ago yeah but then it's also you know do you think well if you did it five years ago it probably wouldn't have got off the ground and now i feel like we're building up this you know this real energy and this real um this real uh momentum with it with podcasting um, where, or, or with yeah. just with Highway 61? Well, just with the podcast and Highway 61 and, um, you know, where we're going with it. We've only released two podcasts since we, you know, were officially created this year. But in terms of what we've got in production, we're doing so much. And it's just like all of this, all of these ideas that I'm bringing out where, you know, there is a Chelsea project. Of course there is. Well, there's two. Um, but then there's film projects. There's, you know, other sport projects. There's music projects. Um and yeah, there's a lot of passion that goes into them, but at the same time, they're projects that I think that have really got legs and that can really do a lot, you know. And so that's sort of how I went from being this football writer who, you know, wasn't hitting the heights of Henry Winter, but then I didn't try to because I was trying to carve a different path. And uh, and then it, I think I just realised maybe a little bit too late what I wanted to be. And then you know, my colleague Kerry Levy. Um, he's a document documentary maker. And I met him because he's a Chelsea fan. I did a podcast with him that it was sort of me and Kerry that sort of pushed me along to the lines to where I get now, where I was like, I sort of realized what I was. And I, and I think I was scrapping around in the wrong area for a bit too I long. Think, I think as a filmmaker, he, 
I get the feeling that film podcast narrative podcasting is closer to filmmaking than it is to to broadcast journalism. Yeah, much it, it definitely is. Yeah, it really, really, really is. And and this is the thing is that my friendship with Kerry um, started. It was almost like we became friends because of Chelsea, but then we stayed friends because of the documentaries that we love. You know that it, our friendship goes way beyond Chelsea. And Kerry has made some really and really really good work and. The, the best bit so basically before i asked him to come on board to help me make this chelsea project that we've been working on for a while i was like i just want to make sure that you know what he talks about is applied to his documentaries and i i watched this documentary called bananas that he did where he's um he he follows the, the band gorillas around for for seven years <clears throat> and i just watched it and there was it was, it was a really good documentary but there's one point in it that just sort of just it was that you know eureka moment I was like, okay, Kerry talks the language that I want to talk. You know, not necessarily the same language as me, but what Kerry's done there is what I want to do. Um, and In it was what just way? This... Would like a running thing or something? Yeah, so, yeah, so what happened is at the start of the film, Damon is flipping a cigarette into his mouth and he can't get it into his mouth. He, he can't catch it, you know. And then you watch the movie, you watch the movie and it's like gorillas, it's just gorillas are being formed and and Damon and Jamie, the artists, are together where they're creating the idea and then they release the album, they go on tour, they go to the US, they play this gig up in Harlem with Dennis Hopper coming in and all that, you know. And um, and you, so you see this, but not at one point does Kerry say, like, you know, 97, 98, 2001 or whatever. And he's got this narrative going. And then at the very end, um, I hope I remember this right, at the very end they're in a, an airport terminal and Damon's got a cigarette and he flicks it and catches it. And Kerry catches on camera and he looks at the camera and he's like, seven years that's taken me. And that's when I was like, wow, like this documentary is a seven year journey. And he's bookended it with this very, very small little bit of information. You see it throughout the whole film where Damon's flicking it, trying to catch it and he can't. Yeah. And and I was like, wow, he's just like, he's shown the, the audience, he's shown the viewer this is seven years without actually telling them. And it is that concept of show don't tell, which is so difficult. Yeah. But then when I saw that, I was like, he's, he's done what I want to do. Yeah. And he's done it in the way that I want to do it. And, um, a great that, documentary, I think because it's real can reach you in some, sometimes more than a moving movie, a, a, a fictional movie. I can remember coming back from the States once and I watched, have you ever seen uh, finding sugar man? Oh, no, searching for sugar. Searching man. for sugar man. That's it. Searching for, right. Absolutely I saw that. Incredible. I saw that on a plane coming across the Atlantic, and Julie picked me up from the airport, and she said, "So how was it?" I said, "I saw the most incredible film on the plane." And she went, "No, no. How was the the conference here?" I said, "No, no, no, no. As soon as we get home, we're going on uh, iTunes, and we're going to watch this film. What's it about?" So I'm not telling you anything about it because that's how I, I, you know, you're on a plane flicking for something to yeah. watch. I said, "I didn't know anything going in." And it was just amazing. And it is. And something like that. So I get what you mean. I haven't seen the one you're talking about, but that kind of experience yeah. that, that you have with a documentary, you can't, I, I don't think, I, I don't know of many, I, don't, I can't think of a movie that's moved me the same way as something like that. Absolutely incredible that is. And the funny yeah. thing is, the guy who produced that or helped produce it to finish producing it, his name's John Batsek. Right. And he's a Chelsea fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, so what happened is... Um, John knows Kerry. Yeah. And we were doing this Chelsea podcast that we do. And um, and John came in. And um, I was like, oh, hi, how you doing? You know, just before we start recording. And we're there to talk about, you know, Chelsea and the, the weekend's fixtures and whatnot. And I said, oh, how do you know Kerry? He goes, oh, I'll make documentaries and stuff. I said, all right, um, what have you done? And he started listening for you off. And he went and did Searching for Sugar. Oh, you did Searching for Sugar, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, John. I was like, that is amazing. And I was going over it with him. And um, because of his, the guy he did it with is a guy called Simon Chin. And he did like Man on Wire and a few others like that. And um, I was just waxing lyrical about it. Then um, I was like, S yeah, such an incredible story. And then Rodriguez, the singer, yeah. after that, because I'm massive into Bob Dylan, it's sort of. Well, there's D it's Dylan esque, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, and then I went to watch him live at the Hammersmith Apollo. Rodriguez? Yeah, because he wow. came over. Wow. After that. 
and it was just such an incredible experience watching him <laughs> on stage. But I was like, wow, and, and John was a Chelsea fan. So we've um, been talking to John about some of the stuff we're working on now because um, John's company, obviously being this documentary maker, I was like, look, do you think there's a a relationship together? You know, We don't know if we'll be able to do anything together, but I was like, I'd love to work with you on some stuff. Um, because of what you say, is like doing these narrative podcasts, it's like audio doc Kerry yeah call it's the same Kerry it's the same it's the imagery and the storytelling it's, yeah. there's no real difference except it's probably easier in a podcast because you don't need the lighting to be right <laughs> yeah exactly you just need the sound to be right but <laughs> Kerry says it was oh you've got to drop this narrative podcast malarkey he's like they're not narrative podcasts they're audio mentries and he thinks he's coined this term audio mentry I'm like no it's narrative <laughs> podcast no 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 I call it this term audio mentry in five years time everyone's going to call them audio mentries I'm like yeah all right, keep dreaming. I'm going to be plugging narrative podcasts, mate. But um, yeah, so that, that's how I sort of got into it, really. And I was like, okay, look, I can do this. And then working with Kerry is, I'd sort of, like I say, I think I'd just be in mates with him. And then in the end, we would just phone each other like teenage girls, like just chatting about stuff generally. And we just sort of became mates. And, um, and then from there, I think I just realized that um, I'd been hanging around in the wrong industry for a bit too long. Um, cause I'd done everything I wanted to do and, um, not that I'd achieved like this massive success, but I was like, Hey, I completed journalism. It wasn't anything like that. It was just more like, okay, look, I think I've just, everything I wanted to do, I've done. And I don't want to be here when I'm 45 sort of searching for something to do. And then, um, obviously one thing leads to another. And then four years down the line, I'm creating highway 61 in the, you know, in the image that I wanted to, and hopefully it succeeds. But a couple of the podcasts that you've got out right now are not narrative podcasts. Um, oh. Neil Reynolds doing the NFL one. Good listen, yeah. though. How did that yeah, happen? So, yeah, so Neil Neil and I have been working together for about four years. So this is what I was saying about how I left Chelsea. I was like, look, I can't just be this this child you know, doing Chelsea forever. So, um, yeah, so I, I just started getting work, you know, doing stuff everywhere, you know, applying those skills. And that led to me through one thing or another – I know nothing about the NFL, but ended up working with the NFL, working with Neil on some publications. And um, we just, again, we just created this um, this friendship, I guess, like this professional friendship where, I don't know, this is what I do with people where I'm just like, I'm unrelenting. I'm like, just on them. And in the end, we, we did a podcast last year, which was a narrative series called um, Overtime, which is all about um, NFL culture in the UK. And then that led to... we. I did all this breakdown of it and I just said to Neil, I was, look, these, these are the numbers that we were getting. I did this series report and I was like, but if we're going to do a series two, it needs to be more like this. And he said, it's so funny you say that because I've wanted to do my own series, you know, like life stories. Um, so I was like, well, let's get together and do this. And then we just sort of rebranded over time as the Neil Reynolds podcast, but obviously did it as a separate project. Um, and it's sort of like a narrative mixed in with an interview where Neil has these little bits of voiceover in there, but it's so sort of like a hybrid style podcast. Um, and it's just this whole idea of, you know, when, when we speak to the players, we, Neil says to them straight up, or, you know, the, the executives that we've spoken to, we're not here to talk about whether you're getting traded. We're not here to talk about the, puck, the, the catch you made last week. We're here to talk about how you got to the NFL. You know, what, what's, what's your journey? And then it's sort of, we, we, you know, we've been getting real long interviews with some people that normally only ever give out five minute interviews and they're done. Whereas we've been able to sit down and really get them to relax, which is what Neil's really good at. Um, you know, I think in the UK, especially anyone who follows the NFL knows that there's no one better in the, in the UK or probably outside of the US when it comes to NFL coverage than Neil, you know, he's like the anchor on sky sports and you know, so he's the face of it here. But when he speaks to these players, especially the ones that he's built relationships with over time, they really, really respect him. And um, and you see it, that when they talk to him, they, they really open up. So, um, yeah, that's, that's been a really good series to work on. We're up to um, episode 18 on that now. And um, we've had, like, a really varied, you know, group of, you know, current players, former players, um, a couple of executives, some coaches. Um, we launched it with, um, obviously, COVID sort of killed some of the style of it, where we launched it with Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's the the current quarterback for the Miami Dolphins and Neil knows him really well. So we went fishing with him for the day. Um, right. And we, we did the interview and, you know, mixed in some of the fishing with it. And we, we're going to, at some point we're going to release the whole fishing experience as a bonus episode later on in the year. 
Um, so we did this interview with Fitz, and then um, we interviewed the the head coach from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, Bruce Arians, when we were in Tampa. And then we flew back, and obviously lockdown happened. So we had all these grand plans of we were going to go over for training camp in you know July and August, and we were going to you know go on a road trip through Florida up into Georgia and speaking to a lot of these players. But in the end, we've had to persevere and you know do these interviews online, you know using you know online technology to do it. Uh, so it sort of killed it a bit in terms of how big we were going to make it, mm. but we've still been able to you know put out a good show. Um, so it's maybe not as narrative as we wanted it to be because what we were going to do is um, we were going to do a ser- part of the series was going to be going from training camp to training camp, speaking to these players, getting their stories, and then moving on to the next one and sort of telling these stories as we went. So the narrative aspect of it we had to sort of pull out, which I've, I guess a lot of people are having to do at the moment um you know with their productions um and then the other show we do with him is game picks which is just like this fun game show where this is a big thing in the nfl where they love predicting games and i was just like when neil said we should do this i was like really but then it's been a big hit for us i was yeah, like okay it's, it's yeah, big we'll, in australia we'll as well with, with rugby league people that uh, yeah, tipping just, football tipping yeah yeah i just never understood it um <laughs> So we, we've done that. Obviously, we're five weeks in because it's game week five and Neil remains unbeaten at the moment. But so we just get a different guest on every week and they just predict the games. And um, that's been fun doing that. But then the other stuff we've got in production at the moment, um, which COVID has sort of hampered a little bit in terms of us being able to get out and, and get them finished, is um, last year leading into Highway 61 being formed, I spent six weeks um, in New York, New Jersey and Nashville um, recording a series about Bruce Springsteen. Is that um, where you took the picture that's on your website? Yes, it is. Yeah, that. So that was um, that's that picture on the website is outside his second child at home, which was uh, it's thirty three and a half Institute Street, and um, that's where he grew up, where he first saw the Beatles on TV, and you know, and saw Elvis, which sort of changed his life. So that there's the picture of him leaning up against a tree, and then when we were there, I was like, "Well, it'd be rude not to, right?" Got to do um, it. Yeah. So um, yeah, we went and did that. It was amazing. We actually went and knocked on the door and just like just set door set the people that lived there. And we're like, "Do you mind if we just talk to you?" But and they're like, "Yeah, come in, brother." And we yeah, and then then uh, literally like down the street, down the block, um, there's a street called South Street, 68 South Street, is where he basically. He lived as a teenager with his parents because uh, this house, 33 and a half Institute Street, is like it's like a box, you know, it's like tiny. And um, so they moved down the street and then went and knocked there. And it's like this um, this immigrant Mexican family living there now. And they'd never heard of him. They'd never heard of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> no, because the guy was like, hey, he goes, they live in the house. Yeah, they live in the house. Yeah. And he goes, I wondered why people across the street are always taking pictures of the house. <laughs> And he, he'd lived in America for a few years. And he said, I didn't realise this guy was such a big deal. You know, he's, this guy is coming from Latin America. Um, he's moved into America to, you know, with his family to work. And, yeah, I was just like, look, you know, you've never heard Bruce Springsteen before. He's like, nope. So I got on my phone and I said, look, you live in Freehold, New Jersey. This song is about Freehold, New Jersey. And I played in my hometown on my phone. I was recording it all at the time. And I was like this guy's listened to Bruce Springsteen for the first time. And he's like, hey, man, this is pretty cool. And then we went and sat in the kitchen um, where, I don't know if you're a big Springsteen fan, but he, he talks about, you know, he, he would come in at night and into the kitchen and it'd be pitch black. And then he'd see the cigarette light up from where his dad was sat in the kitchen smoking, waiting for him to come in. Because he'd come in, it'd be dark, and he'd be like, yes, he's not up. And he'd see the cigarette light up. And he'd go, oh, and then his dad would give him a lot of grief. And I was stood in the kitchen. I was like, wow, like this song, this this kitchen here is like a kitchen that inspired so many of his lyrics, but inspired songs like Independence Day. And you know, I was just like, wow, it's like this real moment, you know, for any fact, you know, like the moment of like you're going to Stanford Bridge to work, you go into where Bruce Springsteen lived as a kid. And again, though, like I I, I look back and I wish I'd asked if I could go upstairs and see yeah. his bedroom and stuff. Yeah. But I was like, a family lives here. Maybe Louis Theroux, because he's a better documentarian <laughs> than me, he would probably go, hey, I'm just going to go upstairs and just go up there. But I just felt like I was putting myself on the family too much. So I was, we was in there for about 10 minutes. And did but, you, uh, will, will you be, is there any of this in the podcast? Yeah, yeah, that's all in there. Yeah, it's yeah. all in there. 
Yeah, yeah. So we recorded everything. So we record us right. knocking, and then him answering the door. I'm like, can we come in? And um, he didn't speak like um, very fluent English. So we're talking through like my Mockney accent, and him going, I can barely understand Americans. That alone is British <laughs> guy, you know. And, and then, but I was wearing my Chelsea tracksuit top at the time. And then he was a Barcelona fan. He's like, oh, Chelsea, Chelsea. And I was like, yeah, and we always turn over Barcelona, mate. I was like, <laughs> you know. Uh, so so that, that's a series of, um, yeah, it's called Born to Run After the Boss that we're doing. And it, it's sort of just like, um, it's about the culture of Bruce Springsteen fandom, but just the culture of New Jersey and just sort of bringing this together as this melting pot of everything that he represents, you know. But just telling it through the eyes of, you know, some fans and then speaking to like people from New Jersey. And, you know, it, it went so well where we were in Asbury Park, a tiny little place. I'd never been there before, tiny little place. And I just thought, oh, you know, it's going to be this big place. We'll go there. We'll get some stuff and that'll be it. And then we, we were there and it was like tiny. Like, I couldn't believe like the E Street Band had come out of it. And um, we were walking down the street with all our equipment because I was with my co-producer, Ryan, who lives in America and was helping me. And we had people coming up to us going, hey, you're those British guys. And we were like, oh, who have we pissed off? You know, <laughs> or like, what have we said? What have we said? And they were like, oh, I know a story about Bruce. And I was like, oh, okay. Wait, let me just record it. Quick sound test. Yeah, okay, tell us your story. And we just had all these people stopping us. Oh, you're those Bruce guys. Because it just got around town that we were there. And in the end, I got a phone call. And they were like, it was um, this woman who runs the Bruce Springsteen archive. And she was like, do you want to come down and see the archive? And it's not open to the public, but what they do is they, they take stuff from the archive and put it on for exhibitions. Yeah. And um, it's at, um, it's at Monmouth university. And, um, so I went down there. I had like all this access to, I was reading like essays that Springsteen had written as a 14 year old, you know, and it's absolutely, so I recorded everything and I recorded me being given the tour around there and that, so we've got this amazing content. Um, we've been back and forth on that, where um, my brother is doing all the sound production on it with me because he's a musician. And um, obviously with COVID, we, we've got some other bits we just need to finish before we can put it out. Yeah. But then we've been back and forth on what we're trying to do with it is, I said to my brother, I, goes, Look, I want this to sound like an album. You know, I want it to be that people Because you can't use it. original music, can you? Because of license. No, no, we can't. But, but then at the same time, we're like, it's almost a good thing that we can't because... Although you'd be able to play a bit of music, like you could play the harmonica from, you know, one of the songs to really, you know, bring it in, you know, and really evoke that memory for people when they listen to it. But I just said to my brother, I was, look, it's almost a good thing that we have to be creative with our own music. So I said, I want it to sound like this live album that people are listening to. And then it weaves in with all the, you know, the narrative. And then some more music comes, you know, we're trying to make, so basically we haven't got that sound right yet. And I said, I, I want this to, I know it's a big ambition and we might be way off the mark, but I said, I want this to do for music podcasts, what Serial did for true crime podcasts, because Serial happened and then suddenly everyone's got a true crime series. I was like, yeah. I want to do this where it's done with such heart and such attention to detail and love and care that people hear it and they just, you know, obviously it's going to be made for Springsteen fans to listen to, but I just want music fans to hear it and go, wow, this is really cool where they've done something different here. And, um, you know, and some of the stories we're telling and sort of allowing those stories to breathe and be told. And, um, that, yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to do with it. So whether we achieve that or not, obviously remains to be seen, but that's, that's the ambition of it. So what else are you working on right now? Exciting times. Yeah, it is. It's, um, exciting times. I mean, to be, and to be involved with any kind of company that's just starting and growing is an exciting thing anyway, but something that you're pa so passionate about, like narrative podcasts and also getting to be involved in things you're also involved in, which is Chelsea and Bruce Springsteen, you're living the dream, mate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically living the dream and hoping it doesn't become a nightmare. Basically. <laughs> um, but so, so we've got the blueprint, which is um, a series telling how Chelsea went from Premier League also ran, so you know, basically from the advent of the Premier League in 92 through to 2012 about how they became European champions, but also having a cultural perspective on it of, of how Chelsea um, inadvertently changed the landscape of of English football and then sort of how that crosses over into, into the European game as well. You know, So the pivot point is... Abramovich coming in 2003, which is sort of like a nice way of doing it because 
he comes in right in the middle of the story. Yeah. Because you can start the story in 92 and then right in the middle of it, Abramovich appears. And then obviously 2012 is the is a Champions League. So it's telling that, putting Chelsea into this cultural perspective. And then um, we've got a series about the Berlin Wall that we're working on. Um, there's a series about um, 80s teen movies um, that, we're, that we've got in development. Um, yeah, so just trying to bring in the... So obviously Neil Reynolds, what we've done with Neil is they're not narrative narrative but then these ones that are in production obviously take a bit more time yeah um they're the ones that yeah obviously are going to be the the crux of what we're doing with our narrative stuff so um yeah just working on them trying to get them done with the challenges of covid um yeah been back and forth to berlin a little bit since they've been out allowed us to travel um just to record stuff because what we're trying to do with that is um create a history series which is um the whole idea being ordinary people in extraordinary situations yeah. so rather than speaking to you know leading politicians at the time about the berlin war and and whatnot it's just getting these really personal stories about what it was like living in the west or living in the east so right. we've got a pilot episode that we put together on that which is um about how this woman crossed over the wall um when she was um 17 years old and eight and a half months pregnant because her partner lived in the west and He'd been in the East and then he had gone to the West and they kept meeting in Prague and having naughty time, shall we put it. And she got pregnant and she was like, I don't want to raise my kid in the East. I want to get to the West. So it was all about her challenges of trying to get to the West. So trying to tell these really personal stories of, you know, we know the bigger picture, but what about what was happening in houses, you know, in homes and in families and yeah. these, really per these really personal sides of it. So, um, yeah, just trying to really tell these stories in a creative way that obviously catches an audience but also sort of gets people to relate to it well i hope you change the world i really do <laughs> because uh, no because you're the real deal you know some people's motivation for getting into things is often money or whatever but you know you're the real deal you're doing this because you actually and it seems that you've lived your whole life that way that if there's something that you feel that means something to you and you want to share that passion or at least you know bring people along because you know enthusiasm is infectious and and to bring people along and bring these stories to life i just think it's brilliant and uh, it's about time we had something like that in the uk and i think you're the only indie that's that's doing that with that mission plan as far as i can well as far I, as I, I hope think. you are I hope yeah. you are, and I hope there's not more indies that come along until we're established, and we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll help you because we're established now because we, we, can, we can feed ourselves. Well, but... they will because you will influence them. That's the great thing about people like you, that, that you're, you'll put your passion out there and do it, and then someone will pick up on that, like you picked up on Springsteen and Chelsea and Dylan. That's what's going to happen. It's, it's an odd four. It, you know, if someone is influenced by it and or someone listens to this and they find it influential, I, it would be great. It's odd to think I, if someone says that to me, like, oh, you influenced me. I don't know how. I, yeah, I'd always be a bit like, really? Like, I'm just a working class chav from Peterborough, mate. I don't know what you're influenced <laughs> by. You know, but that's because you're uh, British. Like, if you were American, you'd just go, oh, thank you very much. Because they love all that. That's the difference. Yeah, between see, that, 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 yeah it's funny because like, I was chatting. Um, I was chatting to a friend the other day. And not that I've got a massive, massive, so, massive social following, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's an active audience. And um, she just said to me about, oh, you should be more vocal on some some certain issues. And I was like, yeah, but what am I going to offer to that? You know, I was like, yeah. And she said, yeah, but they listen to you about Chelsea. I was like, yeah, but I was like, do they? I, I don't know. I, I just find it hard. You know, you saying that it was sort of like this reality check that made me scared for a second. I was like. <laughs> Oh, if I've bitten off more than I can chew, because if I'm, if I really am, yeah, if people like say, oh, it was an, it, it'd be amazing if it did, but at the same time, like, it makes me feel very, yeah, nervous and scared that I'm like, shit. But it, it has know, to I... happen because you're following, you're following what you truly believe in and and what's important to you, and so it's real. So it will happen. I mean, it has I, to, and I, I hope it does. And take some beta blockers or something now. <laughs> Gary Hayes, the podcast company is called Highway 61. It's just like the Bill, the Dylan song, Highway 61 Revisited. I hope uh, I hope we get to revisit at some stage and talk again, mate. Recorded, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> 
Should we let them in on a secret? This is the second time we did this. We did this a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't. Uh, did we? Yes, we did. And uh, actually, though, now be honest, I think it went better this time. Actually, you know what? You can call this episode Highway 61. Revisited. revisited. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I'd uh, I'd had an upgrade on my Apple and it hadn't upgraded the software I used to record and we didn't record it. We did a similar time, just over an hour, and we didn't record it. But now we have. It's history now. I'm, I'm glad you think it went well because I was really nervous um, talking about myself twice and I didn't want to... <laughs> Yeah, in terms of saying the same stuff that we've maybe spoken about, because I didn't want to just sort of bore you by almost reading off a script again or something, where I was like, oh, yeah, and here's a story you heard before, and I've got to tell you again, where you're like, oh, I've heard this one before, mate. You're a bit boring. <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you think it went better, which is good. I do. I think it, I did I didn't think it went a lot better. Yeah, it I've was great. have got a better backdrop this time as well. I've come out of my study. See, everything's better about it. It's, good, it's a good job we did it again. We did Highway 61 revisited. 